Well, it is so nice to be here um, and joining you guys in Owensboro. I have been here before <clears throat> at the sporting goods store. Uh, I did something there. So I think I was on stage there as well uh, with some singers. Uh, good job, uh, the, the, the initial preachers right here. I appreciate that message. Uh, she's preaching my sermon. <laughs> about evangelism, one of my favorite stories as well, uh, the woman at the well, and uh, uh, yeah, she was one of the first evangelists, um, for sure. Well, it is good to be here tonight, I'm, the name of my talk is Legacy, which was apropos, right? <laughs> I actually just said, this, is this really called Legacy? <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to talk about Legacy, oh, thank you, do I sound... Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's so great to be here. And then tomorrow morning, I'm going to talk. Who will be here tomorrow morning at church? Yeah. All right. It's going to be two different talks, so you can come back. And, but I will talk about evangelism uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, tonight is legacy. Uh, what does legacy look like? I blew the duck as I came up. I cannot get away from the duck. I believe my whole, it's going to be really hard for me to separate from this idea of ducks. And what's crazy is it wasn't even my idea, it was my dad's. Like he was the one super into ducks. And so he comes out with this duck call. So my, my legacy will always be connected uh, somehow to a duck. Do you know how many places I go and they say, I know what you want to eat, duck. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to eat your duck. It's hard to cook and make it taste good. Uh, but everybody thinks, oh, I know what you'd love to eat. And I'm like, no, it's not duck. Um, I was on Mass Singer. Now, Mass Singer is a show, and when you go out there, you're in Los Angeles, and they're like, look, this is where you're wearing a mask. This is where you can have. Whatever personality you want to have, you can have whatever accent you want to have. You can be a completely different person than you are in real life. And I said, this is going to be awesome. And they said, we've got your costume. It's a duck. <laughs> Even on the show, I couldn't get away from the duck. Um, so I'll forever be connected with the duck. But I'll tell you this, uh, with the legacy that is, at my funeral, I promise there won't be one mention of anything of an episode of Duck Dynasty or something I said that will be separated and won't even be talked about. Isn't that crazy how much we think about the stuff that's in our life and we get so caught up in it that it's going to be like this big legacy. But then when you think about your funeral, it won't even be mentioned. It won't even come up in the conversation. Even if you had a show like, like we had a show that was very popular, shown all over the world, but, but I want my legacy to be different than what I do in my vocation, or I want to be known for something different. So I want a Christ-like legacy. And so what would it look like to have a Christ-like legacy? Psalm 145.4 says, one generation will praise your works to another generation and will declare your mighty acts. So think about it. One generation praises God to the next generation. That's that Christ, uh, that's that godly legacy that is passed down. So if you think about legacy and you think about how to improve your legacy or how do you change your legacy, it's actually working backwards. It's Knowing where you are here, or where you want to be, and then going backwards, and you should live your life differently moving forward. It's kind of like we tell our kids. I see a lot of kids here. You tell your kids, hey, if you want this, this is what it's going to take to get there, so you're going to have to work like this to be able to get there. Whether that's a job, whether that's college, whatever that looks like. If you want this, if you want a new car, here's what that's going to take to get there. And so we think we, we go backwards from there. So as I think about my life, think about it like this. I'm thinking about being in eternity with God. I want to be in heaven forever, for eternity. 
So now I'm going to work backwards from that thought. I'm going to work backwards. Well, if you go backwards from there, you'll hit your funeral. That'll actually be after your death. Uh, so you're going to hit your funeral. What, what are they going to talk about? What are they going to bring up? What will be mentioned? Have you ever been to like to a sad funeral where they talk about stuff and you're like, is that it? Is that it? I remember this uh, young guy passed away. It was all about LSU. And I thought, ugh, I hope they say more of my passing than just the college team that, because really I had no influence over, I was just watching, right? And I remembered I was kind of sad over that. Um, so if you go back before the funeral, we have our death, whether you know about it or whether you don't. And then before that, we have life. We have today. We have here. And so you think about your legacy. I think if we think backwards, if we think that way, it will improve the way we live our lives. It will make things more important. What a tough way. This has been a heavy week for myself. I've been, if you've been watching the news, um, just thinking about it loss of life and war, and you really start thinking, like, what's really important? Uh, what, what are we living for? So I saw this played out, this legacy, these two different legacies, and I saw it play out a couple of weeks ago. Did anybody watch the Super Bowl? Um, <clears throat> so we had the Rams versus the Bengals, okay? I was pulling for the Bengals. Uh, that's who I like. Uh, how many of you here were pulling for the Bengals? All right, what about the Rams? <laughs> Y'all are really not gonna like me now. <clears throat> uh, so I, I did some research on this. Uh, the ram, it was actually, it used to be a pagan symbol. Did you know that? Now, some of you were wondering like, what does that mean? It basically means the rams are from Satan. <laughs> <laughs> The law, think about it, Los Angeles, Rams, yeah, they're the devil. Uh, I pull for the Saints, okay? So, uh, I, think I'm, I think I'm good with the Saints. Uh, so you had the Rams versus the Bengals, and um, there was, I was we, we watched the game, my wife and I watched the game, which is, oh man. But my wife, here's the problem. She doesn't, she doesn't care about the game. All she has questions about are like the dumbest thing, like the color schemes, the uniforms, the, the gold posts, and why this is it's the whole game. And so uh, I'm like, you can just come back for half time. You can just watch the show, and then I can watch the game. But we watched this game. The game's over. The Rams won. And there, there was uh, the MVP was given out to Cooper Cup, who was a receiver, which is very unusual that a receiver wins this. And uh, he had an unbelievable year. And I start hearing him talking about God. But not just like, hey, you know, praise. I mean, he was like really invested in God. And I thought, wow, he sounds like he's on my team. Uh, and so I did some research on Cooper Cup. And sure enough, he is a godly guy. And I don't know if you've heard this story or not. But in 2019, he had torn his ACL up, and he didn't get to get, he didn't get to play in the Super Bowl. That's when they went to the Super Bowl. Remember, they cheated the Saints, and there was a bad call. I don't know if y'all remember that. But there was a really bad call. They ended up going to the Super Bowl, and they got destroyed, which is good for them. But Cooper didn't get to go, and so uh, Cooper had a vision from God that they were going to go back to the Super Bowl, and that he was going to win the MVP. True story. And so it said then he changed his whole mindset. And he said he played not for victory, but from victory. Because he knew he trusted God and said, this is going to happen. And then he said he did all the hard work knowing where he was going to be. And that's the idea uh, of, of this thought, like, this is where we know where we're going. And so this is where we're going to work. And he really did have this vision. And lo and behold, it really happened. Cooper said, I got to play in a place where I was validated, not from anything that happened on the field, but because of my worth in God and my Father. Isn't that awesome? Um, that he came up with, you know, that he lives his life like that. And so you have this moment where he's the MVP of the Super Bowl, but yet he's creating this Christ-like legacy. 
So he's giving the glory to Jesus. Um, so actually I was, and, and also said he has t-shirts and hats. So I was like, I'm going to support this guy. So I went on his website to buy a shirt. <laughs> Everything is sold out. Everything is sold out. So I'm looking, there's literally nothing to buy. So I get to the end of the website and it said, if you want to leave Cooper and his team a message, you can. And I left him one. Uh, hey, this is Willie from Louisiana. Um, congrats on the Super Bowl. And I, I did put this in the message. Next time God gives you a vision, buy more inventory. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not questioning the vision, I'm just questioning the business sense. Like, uh, as a guy who sold a lot of inventory uh, overnight over something happened, I, I understand probably where he was at. Um, so when I think about legacy, I think about legwork. Kind of sounds the same, legwork for God. That's that legacy, it's really just a lot of legwork is going to create that legacy. Um, I, I was walking through this building here. And it's amazing uh, what something was and meant to be and watching how God has used it and transformed it. But I'm sure when they built this building, they had no idea that in this lobby would be all these people, you know, uh, thinking about God and worshiping. And, and God's neat like that. And uh, there's a guy I know back home. Uh, he... Uh, he kind of favors you, uh, is it Tinker? Tinker? Uh, Tinker looks like he should be on Duck Dynasty. Uh, <laughs> we're buddies. He's been in my office. He has a picture of him in my office. So, um, but there's this guy, and he's an unusual guy that I hang out with back home. And um, he screams Jesus at the top of his lungs, uh, especially at church. And it's, it's and it, it'll make you jump. Like, it's... Uh, <laughs> I saw, I, he threw, I invited him over, he was at another church, and I invited him to come to our church, and so Pastor Tom was preaching, our pastor, he threw Tom so far off, he had to go by and like reset himself from the stage, <laughs> that's how Larry uh, Kirk was when he screams Jesus, and he, uh, I thought, so he's kind of a handyman, and so I, we were doing some work, and at a house, and I said, Kurt, come help me. Um, I thought, since he screamed Jesus all the time, he would love worship music. So I put on worship music at the job site. Well, for three hours, Kurt just stood there and worshiped for three hours. <laughs> he did no work. I was like, this is a terrible idea. <laughs> we cannot listen to worship music uh, with Kurt because uh, he can't handle it without going into worship. Uh, <laughs> But I hang out with him a lot, and I invite him over to the house for dinner. And my daughter says, hey, Dad, is that the Jesus guy? <laughs> That's what she called him, the Jesus guy. And then something, that hit me, and I thought, I think I'm the duck guy. He's the Jesus guy. How do I become the Jesus guy? How do I become that? And then I realized. To change that part of my legacy, I've got to do way more so that when people even see me, they think, that's the Jesus guy. Yeah. That's the guy that followed Jesus. That's the guy that talks about Jesus all the time. And so no matter what you've done, God never called us to be small or, or to not be successful. Uh, but that guy, when I'm at my funeral, I want way more about Jesus and way more how it impacted the kingdom of God than anything I did in life or TV or anything like that. Right? Yeah. So I think to be the Jesus guy, we really need to study who is Jesus. Who is Jesus? What did he do? We heard there was a great story uh, about he with the woman at the well. There, there's one that, there's a chapter I found in the Bible that I think is fascinating. Uh, Matthew 4. Uh, Matthew 4, and I'm going to go through it really, really quick. Uh, I'm actually going to start at the end. As we're talking about going backwards, I want to read the last verse in Matthew 4. It said, large crowds from Galilee, uh, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across Jordan followed him. Large crowds followed him. That's the last verse. Well, what I wanted to find out was why. Why 
Why was everybody following him? This is Matthew 4. He was born in Matthew 2. <laughs> the quick jump to where big crowds are following him. And I, I had to find out why. I was like, why, why did everybody follow him? And what I found was this really this blueprint of how to create a legacy. Because Jesus has a legacy, right? 2,000 years later, we're halfway across the globe from where he was, and we're still talking about him. We're still gathering. We're still giving praise. Our most valuable player from the Super Bowl is dedicating everything he has because of Jesus. How about that legacy? That's unbelievable, the legacy, yes. So I went to the first of the chapter of Matthew 4. And this is how it starts. Remember, it ends with everybody following. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Then he fasted. Jesus was led by the Spirit. I think if we're going to start having a Christ-like legacy, if we want to, perhaps some of you guys in here need to actually change the legacy from even how you walked in the door of where you are in your life, you've got to start with the Spirit. That's where it started. Jesus didn't follow too many things, but he followed the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. Isn't that amazing that he was led by the Spirit? Then he fasted. See, when I first thought of this, I thought, I, I, honestly, I forgot. I thought that he, Jesus, uh, the devil caught him while he was fasting, like, ah, I got you. He's like, oh, I'm weak. I, that's really the one I thought. Then I read the story, and I'm like, oh, no. He did that on purpose. Jesus fasted on purpose because he knew when you're going to take on the devil, you better lock it in and be in total, total, right here with the Father. And what's amazing, we have the Spirit, we have the Father, we have Jesus all right here taking on the devil like chatting. It blows my mind. He was led by the Spirit. It kind of reminded me, so, not to bring up a bad subject, <laughs> think about the pandemic. Did you, did you guys get, oh, I'm not sure, I wasn't up here in Kentucky. Sometimes I felt like, who exactly is leading this thing? Because I look around going, who's the leader? I, I was unsure because we had two different presidents, but then I was like, are we following the scientists? Are we following, is it Fauci? Is it our local people? Is it our governor? Didn't you kind of find that when there's no clear leader in our life, stuff get really chaotic? <laughs> And you look around going, everybody, and it's just like, what is going on? Because there wasn't a clear leader. And Jesus knew right there, he's going to be led by the Spirit. And we have to be led by the Spirit. If our legacy is going to look anything like Jesus or sound anything like Jesus, we have to be led by the Spirit. We have to be led by the Spirit. Um, and I'm not going to go through the three temptations uh, just because we don't have time. But I will say this, the last one was amazing. <clears throat> Remember, he took him up on the, to see all the kingdoms and the splendor. And he said, if you bow down to me, what? I'll give it all to you. You can have all this. Can you imagine the absurdity? The devil is offering him the thing that he actually created in the first place. Now at this point, Jesus says, okay, you can leave. Get away from me. You're gone. But it's amazing why he was tempted like that. Because there's something to that. There's something to that to us. When we look around and we feel like we want to be accepted by the world. And we almost feel like we have to be a little worldly to be able to function in the world. That is a lie that is being whispered to you and to me all the time. And Jesus says, no, no. Remember, everybody's going to follow him anyway. But he said, you can have all this. So think about how when we get online, when we post up, we're like, well, we got to kind of do this. I will say this as far as my legacy with TV. Doug Dusty does have the legacy of being the most watched reality show in the history of cable television. 
It hasn't been touched. It probably won't the way TV works now. But on this reality show, just think one second about reality TV, there was no cursing, no nudity, no scandal, no fist fights, and every episode ended with a prayer that went into not just this country, a hundred other countries, a prayer was invited in. You don't have to act like the world to be successful in the world. And Doug Dallas should prove that. It's just one of the lies that, that the devil whispers to us. And he says, hey, because get, if, had Jesus done that, it would, uh, it would have been kind of like, uh, have you seen the, the commercials, the, the mayhem, you know, where mayhem shows up, and, uh, watch the, and then everything falls apart and something gets destroyed. But then when you turn around and look on, hey, wait, wait, it's gone, right? And that's the way the devil is. See, when you turn around going, I thought, I thought I could have all this, the devil's like, see ya. Let me know how that works out for you. And how many times does that destroy our legacy? Because we, we just listen to the whispers. Some of us have been, it's not a sin to chat with the devil. You ever thought about that? Jesus chatted with the devil. So it's not a sin. But I really feel like some of us have been chatting with the devil for years. We just keep listening. We just keep listening. And we keep listening. We've got to be led by the Spirit. The second thing in this chapter he does, it says, so if you're reading the chapter, it says Jesus is tempted by the devil. The next heading says, at least in my Bible, it says Jesus begins to preach. And I kind of thought about that. It kind of struck me. I thought Jesus always preached. It said Jesus started to preach. He began preaching. Because up until this point, you don't really know who he is. And then he goes, now I'm going to start preaching. And he starts laying out this message. Um, here's some other people who were led by the Spirit who then preached. Uh, Peter. Peter is led by the Spirit. So, quick little New Testament rundown. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels. All right, when that's over, we've got Acts. Acts chapter 1. Is Acts here? Is there a person named Acts in this room? I have never met a person named Axe, and that kid right there, his name is Axe, and I love that. So I'm probably going to name one of my future dogs Axe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that I'll have any more children. <laughs> so we have the book of Acts, which I'm sure Axe knows this very well. Uh, Acts chapter 1, Jesus says adios. Acts chapter 2, he says, hey, wait, I'm going to send the helper. Uh, the Spirit's coming in. How do we know? There'll be no doubt. Woo -woo, here comes the Spirit. All right? And then who gets up in Acts chapter 2 and preaches the first gospel sermon uh, since Jesus left? Peter. If you flip back over a couple of chapters before, Peter is caught very red-handed denying even knowing who Jesus is. And now in Acts, He's out preaching. And nobody questioned him. Nobody said, hey, wait, aren't you the guy? Peter gets up and preaches. He was led by the Spirit. And then he started preaching. What about Saul, who became Paul? So Saul is out killing other Christians. Stephen is killed. Saul's right there. And then Jesus just put the dough pop on him and just blinded him. And uh, my son in law loved the word dope pop. I if I get dope pop. <laughs> I'd say I know I'm in a redneck country. Um, <laughs> so he's laying there. He can't see. He gets up. Now listen, I only listen to the numbers because I want to show you how quick it was. Acts 9 17, he is filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, he began to preach Jesus is the Son of God. That was a quick turn right there. He had this experience with Jesus. He's full of the Holy Spirit. And what does he do? He starts preaching. Jesus goes face to face with the devil. He's tempted, fasted, resists the devil. And then Jesus begins to preach. So here's my question for you guys in the Lord's tonight. 
When did you start preaching? When did you start preaching? Not me. When did you start preaching? Was there a moment in time? Was there when did something happen and you said, it's time for me to start sharing my faith about Jesus? Now, I know what you're thinking. Some of you are thinking, well, Willie, I'm not a preacher. There's the pastor back there. I'm not a preacher. Neither am I. <laughs> Neither were they. Was Peter a preacher? Fisherman. Paul? Tent maker. Christian killer. I don't know. <laughs> Jesus? Carpenter. Y'all know what I do. I sell alcohol. <laughs> you get the idea? That you're not defined by what it is that your job is that tells you somehow that the devil's whispering to you saying, you're not a preacher. You can't talk about that. When you encounter Jesus Christ and when you are led by the Holy Spirit, and if the Holy Spirit lives in you, I promise you, you will have to talk about it. You will have to open your mouth. Godly legacies are not made by people who never talk about God. Who rarely ever talk about God. What's the devil been whispering in your ear? I was telling my wife the other day, I said, the way, it was like this unwritten rule that we're not supposed to talk about our faith. Well, in certain places, it's not wise to talk about your faith. And I was, what a, what a lie from the enemy, from the devil, I can imagine him in heaven going, apparently they've made some kind of unwritten rule where you don't talk about Jesus. I love it. It's awesome. They're just quiet about it. That is from Satan himself. The king of all lies is for you not to talk about the very thing that you live your life for. And if you talk about other things more than that, I would question that faith and that legwork and that legacy. Um, I'll talk about my father more in the morning. We're going to talk about evangelism in the morning. And wait till you get, oh man, that's what I'm really fired up about, is evangelism. So I'm not, I'm going to say that, because the next heading here, uh, Matthew 4, 18 through 22, you got to start gathering new believers. Remember, this is where Jesus calls the, the first disciples. Who was there? Peter. And he says, hey, lay the nets down. I'm going to make you fishers of men. I could spend two hours just on that story. It fascinates me. One, because I love fishing. <laughs> but then just the whole thought of them dropping everything they had. Because he said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Now, I don't know about y'all in Owensboro, but I'd have had to... I had some questions like, what does that mean exactly? <laughs> How are we going to go fish for men? But Peter was there. You know what I love about this story? It's looking back on Peter, the same one who preached in Acts chapter 2. This is where it started. This is where it began. And we have got to start. If you want that legacy to keep going, there's got to be more people. When Jesus left, he said, hey, go make disciples. Baptize them. Teach them everything I've commanded. It's this generation to the next generation. You've got to keep spreading it. And we will talk a lot about that in the morning. But I will say this tonight. We've got to be careful, too, that we don't overlook people. Like, we're like, well, uh, you know, how good can they be? How good will they help the church? You guys are talking about outreach. You never know. You never know what God can do with people. Yeah. These were fishermen. Probably wouldn't have been my choice. I would have thought, fishermen? I don't get it. It was like when we started, uh, <laughs> I was, we were talking about maybe doing a television show. And I was running Duck Commission. And there was one person who I literally said, do not film this person, ever. <laughs> My uncle Si. 
<laughs> the rule was, do not shoot the camera towards him. He is too insane. No one will ever understand him. And I literally thought, why is he even working here? <laughs> First thing I tried to do when I took over the company was I went and met with Dad at the fire side. I said, Dad, look, I'm looking at the budget. We've got Sai. He doesn't, he sleeps like every day on the couch. We can't like, you know, he's retired from the military. Do you think we need to maybe like look a different direction? And do I said, no, nah, leave Sai alone. He's, you know, I said, okay. And then Doug Bouncy comes along, and ha I had no idea that the, the jewel was right there the whole time. I just couldn't see it. I looked past him, and I thought, oh, we need somebody more fishing, more normal. <laughs> 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 Unless you're doing a show like that, and then he becomes very a key part of that. But don't we look over people? Yeah. We look over people when you're playing stuff, and you think, oh, we got to have this, especially with the idea of what you guys or thinking, don't overlook someone. And I'll talk about that in the morning, how uh, when my mother and my father came to the board, we we're gonna play out what that looks like for the future, directly impact. I would not be standing here right now had that not happened. Right. And, that, and that's two people from, you don't talk about Hodog, and I'm not saying this, but uh, jumps. <laughs> I didn't want somebody to say, what do you mean, Poda? <laughs> They're from Junction City, Arkansas. Exactly. Nobody's from Junction City. <laughs> but to think of the legacy where someone comes to the Lord, and if you play that forward, how many millions and millions and millions of people who have been influenced for Jesus, and I can trace that back, to two people. At least that directly affects me. Direct, directly affects my kids. There's no Sadie Roberts and she's not, I mean, millions of people. See how that goes? So we don't look over people going, what? What could literally this person do? You never know. I baptized a guy the other day. I said, I don't know. This may not even be for you. And he was like, what? Well, then I said, could be one of your kids. Could be one of them. You never know. He was like, I've never thought about that. I said, no, we never know. And then the last thing, the last thing is um, he started helping others. Matthew 4, 23 and 24, Jesus heals the sick. Now this one, whew, this one blew me away. So Jesus is healing people, and so they brought, listen, people brought to him all who were ill. <coughs> Whoever they knew who was ill, they brought to Jesus. Here's what they had. With various diseases, suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those with seizures, and the paralyzed. Can you imagine all those people being brought to you? Can you imagine the pressure? See, Jesus was, at this point, everybody was following they all knew who he was. He was, dare I say, famous. <laughs> like, there he is. When he walks in, it's like, there he is. To where people are just literally trying to touch part of what he's wearing. And all these people are coming to him. And now we're just thinking about what he, what, what he just went through. He was tempted by the devil. He had fasted for 40 days. He, uh, when he began to preach, he heard that John was thrown in prison because why? Of him. He just calls all these people from their job to leave everything they've had any of you guys own businesses? Have you hired people? It's scary. <laughs> yes. It's a lot of pressure on you because you're like, if this doesn't work, have you had to fire people? Have you had to let people go? Jesus has all, done all this 
And now he becomes a one-man emergency room. He's a one-man. Think about during the pandemic, everybody's flocking to the hospitals. And, and we, they were like, we're putting too much stress on the system itself. And Jesus is taking all this. And I'm going to tell you something. His plan of salvation was going to happen. He didn't necessarily have to help people. He didn't necessarily have to say, I'm going to help you out. But Jesus taught us one of the greatest lessons here about legacy, which is exactly what you guys are <laughs> we're talking about. It's just crazy. Here at Legacy. When people see that you care about them, when they see that you try to help them, especially with their physical needs, it really opens their heart up to the gospel and to something more important. So when you show people that you care, and that's what Jesus was doing right here. He's healing people and he didn't have to. He's healing because he said, I love you and I care about you. Right in the middle of Matthew 4, he actually quotes the Old Testament, book of Isaiah. And he says, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. And that light is Jesus. But my question for you guys here is, are they seeing the light? Are they seeing the light from this place? Not the building. Are they seeing the light from the people who show up? Are they seeing the light from you? When you walk around, are they like, there's a light in a dark place? We got enough darkness. Just watch TV or go on. It's full of darkness. But what people are looking for is the light. They're looking for the light. Um, I had a friend, um, he, um, he had these brain lesions on his head, like several, I don't really know about that, but it sounded like it could be fatal quickly. And I realized I hadn't shared the gospel with him, so I was trying to speed it up. And uh, he, uh, this sucker though, every time I tried to share the gospel with him, he would say the same thing. He'd say, he who hath not sinned cast the first stone. <laughs> it's the, the only Bible verse he knew. Which, let me translate that. I don't want to hear what you got to tell me about the Bible. Right. And I would try again, and I would try again. And we would talk about his brain. He would talk about, I just try, you know, and he just didn't want to hear. So I finally got him hemmed up. I was in a, we were in New York actually, and we were working on a business deal. It was a big money deal, and he was talking money, and he was so excited. And we were driving home, or, or no, we were driving back to the hotel. And I looked at him, and uh, he's over smoking, he smoked like a freight train. And I said, you know what? I think you're, I think you're going to be dead in 14 years. I don't think you'll be dead. He looks at me, his eyes are this big. <laughs> he goes, what? And I said, just, I'm guessing. Based on how you live, how your age and all that, that's what I think. I said, and then when you die, everybody's going to be splitting up your stuff. Your kids will take stuff and your, you know, your properties. And he has a lot. And he's just staring at me. <laughs> and he said, I've never thought about that. I said, well, you may start thinking about it. And uh, you know what he didn't say? Uh, yeah. He who had not sinned cast the first stone. We finally got past that one. Yeah. But for the first time, I got him to think about something God's different right. about his legacy, what that was going to look like. So we pulled up and to the hotel. And he looked at me and said, can you come to my room and tell me more about that? I said, oh, yes. I went to my room. I got my Bible. Showed him in his room. And just showed him the gospel. Showed him the response. We read people like Peter. And we read Paul. Read these stories. And, and he stood up. He was like, looking like this. And he screams out, I'm getting baptized. <laughs> 
told his wife, and she went, oh, good. And he goes, you are too. <laughs> I said, well, it's midnight here in Manhattan, so I don't know where exactly near the body of water it is, but uh, we can certainly go on a journey and find it. And he goes, no, 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 no. He said, I'm going to wait. I got to tell everybody I know about this. So he starts telling everybody he knows. And so I finally showed up a few weeks later, and there's a crowd like that. Like, there's Jewish attorneys from New York. There's people from Los Angeles. He's a man of, well, uh, he has a lot. <laughs> he knows a lot of people. And he told him, he said, I'm getting baptized. And I want y'all to come watch this. So we showed up, and he said, Will you? Get up there and tell him what you told me in that hotel room. I said, all right, so we got to lay the gospel on. And this guy is baptized, and his wife, his daughter, son-in-law, son. And then people just kept streaming in the water. Blue jeans, shoes, shirts. And they started coming. Started coming. Started coming. So the guy was, he was probably almost 60, he's still alive. <laughs> uh, but he changed, I saw a man change his legacy right there. Like it was all about money and stuff and just most of it was bad. And I saw him change that legacy right there. And this new legacy right there with his family, they all came in. Then these friends over there, there's still people I meet were like, I was there that day when that happened. It was like this book of Acts kind of moment. And that legacy changed right there. Now his legacy will be different. His funeral will be different. Yeah. Everything's going to be different because of who he accepted, who he brought into his life. And so I'm telling you here, if you're here right now, if you don't like the way, if you're, if you're thinking, what are they going to say about me? If you're not sure, ask someone else. They, they may tell you. <laughs> And we may just need to lock in and change that legacy. Go with the Spirit. Start preaching and telling others about Him. Go gather people up around you and start helping people. And I'm telling you, you're going to change your legacy, but you'll change the legacy right in this community. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.